Yeah. So um, we want to go through the script. I know um, Gerald. I've actually done the installation with the with the scripts uh, last week, um, and I got uh, feedback on on Telegram channel about a few items that uh, he did um, at least um, to check uh, for me. So um, today I'm going to do the setup uh with the uh, installation uh using Ansible, uh, Ansible scripts and I'll, I'll i'll kind of have uh or do that in two steps one is to give a, a brief overview of uh the scripts at least how they look like how i have um roles and tasks organized and at least what are we supporting right now and what are we not supporting yet yes and then we go to a server we do ssh into a server and do an installation together live with the screen shared so i'm going to share my screen now and um meanwhile you can you can uh, are you able to see my screen Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. That's a window, right? So we're going to navigate into the project directory. Um, this is where we have um, a repository, at least for the DHS2 tools. So this repository has um, a structure. Um, it has deploy folder, docs folder, and um, at least a readme file here and ansible configuration file so we have our deployment script uh, within the deploy folder and then um, documentations basically um, if we can check what is in documentation real quick uh, then you notice that we have uh, readme files and md files markdown files so uh, uh, the end, end goal is to at least have um, um, guide, guidance within this document. Uh, for instance, if we talk about monitoring, what are we monitoring and uh, which tools are we using, you know? Yeah, and then also give also more information on PostgreSQL tuning and, and much stuff. So we aim at um, having uh, documents, all, all the documents in, in this folder. And then, um, of course, there's a readme file here. This file really has um, a step-by-step -step installation. It looks like this. It's, it's just giving us the step-by-step the -step guide on how you can go about doing installation of the, um, the app with Ansible script prerequisites and things that you need to do during the installation process. Um, so, <clears throat> Within the deploy directory is where we have our deployment uh, code. And we do organize the, the deployment code into roles, Ansible roles. And if I check uh, inside roles, we have DHIS2 role, firewall role, integration role, and then LXD init role and down to proxy. So DHIS2 role is really um, used to deploy DHS2 WAR file. And before that, there are some things that you need to do before you deploy the, the WAR file, such as uh, setting up Tomcat, you know, installing Java, and fixing security, uh, or rather doing best security practices for Java installation and even uh, Tomcat installation, you know. And then there's firewall. Firewall is really related to um, locking the containers that you do create or rather locking the servers that you have to uh, and, and, and opening ports that are really necessary or uh, required to be accessible from the network and not even from the from the network the, the old network per se but only from where they are required to be accessed from for instance uh, for the DHIS2 container or server, you just need to, uh, to open port uh, 8080 for Tomcat, um, Tomcat requests, or rather connection to the Java application, which is a DHIS2 application. 
if you are using port 88, otherwise you really need to open ports that you're using for Tomcat listening. And then um, you really, if it's a sub server running somewhere else, then you need to open also SSH for, for management purposes. And also at the end of the day, if you're deploying your scripts over SSH, then it means um, your Ansible will be using um, the underlying connection being used is going to be SSH. And then we also need to support integration um, um, tasks or rather integration container. We want to create a container that is reserved for uh, integration purposes. You sometimes want uh, your DHS2 application API be consumed by, by some other application or you want DHS2 to be able to um, work with some other application and you need some integration scripts or applications to be running within an integration container. So that is um, going to be handled with this um, module or other role. And then there's an LXD in it. If you're setting up your Ansible on a single server, then at the end of the day, you're going to have um, it running within LXD containers and you want to initiate, you know, um, that one is automated here. However, you could uh, initiate LXD with, uh, with, uh, with an interactive uh, kind of session where you just run LXD in it, and then it, you will set up the, um, the variables manually in an interactive manner. However, that is also, it can be, automated with LXD precede configuration predefined before. And that is what we are doing here. We want user to really um, not be interactive and we want this be automated, less user interaction. That's why you're using LXD in it. And then <clears throat> monitoring is really doing, um, uh, is really ensuring that all the containers that you have, or rather the servers, if you're using distributed environment, and it ensures that all those um, components that you have for, for your DHS2 instance are being monitored using Unin. And we think also of sub, uh, supporting in future other monitoring tools like uh, Subix and yeah, and, uh, and, and even more. And then th there is Postgres container. That one is really, geared towards uh, deploying Postgres container and doing tasks that are related to uh, Postgres setup. And then finally proxy. So proxy is also um, uh, very important in, in our deployment process because at the end of the day to access, to access our, our apps, we go through the proxy and right now, uh, as much as we want to support Apache 2 and, and Nginx right now, what we have implemented already is Nginx. And next is to make sure that we also have support for um, Apache 2. Uh, so, so those are the roles that we have right now. And as time goes by, we might add other roles depending on the, on the need. And <clears throat> yes. so, we will also add, if need be, custom libraries, but right now we don't have libraries here. So we just have um, roles. And maybe in future we want to take, um, uh, to further organize and have uh, inventories and, and, and even the, um, the playbooks within their own directories. Yeah, so right now this is how it is set up, but it, it, it's, uh, it's gonna change if need be in, in future. So, uh, I want to also mention that supported Ansible version is 2.11 because we do want um, uh, also to use uh, community general modules like UFW module. And we want to support LXD container module. It's the module that we use to create LXD containers. If I can just deploy, uh, display one of the one of the um, Ansible script that we have that creates container, you would notice that we wrote this one even, you notice that we are using a community general LXD container. This module comes with uh, 
with community general modules. You need to have community general modules installed with your Ansible for it to work. And one of this is just one of them, but there are other modules like UFW, UFW module also is, is also a member of that, uh, or it's a, it's included within community general module. So for community general module to be able to work, you would need Ansible version um, 2.11 and above. So that means in your setup environment, you really have to make sure that you have that version of Ansible or even a newer version. And uh, for instance, on Ubuntu 18.04, even if you install Ansible with private package, PPR, I mean, the, at least from the official Ansible repository, it will get you 2.9, at least the most uh, fashion that the latest version supported there is 2.990. Uh, so that means if you are running on an Ubuntu 18.04 server, then you need to think of other ways of uh, installing Ansible that will give you the, the very latest version, like using PIP3. Yeah. However, on Ubuntu 20.04 and 22.04, official. PPF for um, Ansible is, is just going to give you a latest version of Ansible out of the box. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so we're going to set it up. Uh, I want us to set up Ansible. Uh, sorry, I want us to set up data to afresh on, on a server somewhere. And, and for you to be able to do that, first thing that you need is the, um, is the server, for, of course. Uh, either 1804, 2004, or 2204. And then number two is your ability to connect to that server. You can use, uh, if you have physical console, if you have SSH, then you need to at least have a uh, connection to that server. And then um, at least the server for now needs to have internet because um, to install Ansible, to make it easier. Otherwise, you there are other ways that you could install packages without internet. But right now, um, we, we are using internet to pull our packages, to install Ansible. And even uh, at the end of the day, when you run Ansible pulls um, DHIS2 image, DHIS2 WAV file from, from the official uh, site that, that needs internet. And uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> Number three is what, um, let's just do a follow, follow the, the installation script, uh, sorry, read me file, this is it. Um, that means we need a fully qualified domain name and then at least an Ubuntu server. Well, SSL certificate is not a requirement. You don't need to have that file physically on the server because you can as well use Let's Encrypt. And then um, the internet access on the servers, of course, and um if you're going to install ansible this way you're not using pip3 then you're going to need ubuntu 2004 and 2204 uh version of uh, ubuntu server so let's ssh to the server And uh, right now, there are no, there's no container running. It's uh, it's a it's not fresh server, but it's no, no DHS to install here. So I want to delete this DHS so that we can just follow and do a fresh installation uh, completely. So we're going to delete this uh, folder, and then we want to first of all before you do installation, you need to pull them deployment scripts from GitHub. And that is done with Git uh, clone. And this is the, um, the project from GitHub. It's available online. So that basically pulls the, the project into the server that you want to do deployment into. And then you need to navigate to the deployment that, I mean, the DHS2 server tools directory. That where, that's where you're gonna have readme file. This is a file that is available also online that you could follow during the installation process. So for deployment, if you want to start deployment, you need to, to do it from the deployment folder and you need to first edit inventory file. 
inventory host file. It has um, the very first 10 lines are really the, um, the containers or rather how your, 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 your script will be deploying your containers. It will have proxy and then it will have databases group and then instances group and then monitoring group. Um, instances are the, the container instance that they are going to be, they're going to be hosting Java or other Tomcat instances of DHS2. And here, um, it means we're going to have two, two instances of DHS2. We're going to have one called DHS2 and another one called uh, training. If in your environment, you just need to run one instance of DHS2, then you don't need to have two. You just need to have one and you can rename it to something else like um, HMIS, for instance. That means it's going to deploy DHS2 with that name. And then you're going to, you're going to have another line um, that creates monitoring container called monitor. And that is going to be hosting Munin that at the end of the day, you're going to monitor your containers or even servers, it depends on your environment. So one of the variables that we would need before installation is the fully qualified domain name. You would need to have a domain name that dissolves to your server's public IP address. Here, the one that I have already is dhis.sakedcoolgut.com. And you need to have an email for let's encrypt uh, notification, for instance. If your certificate is expiring, then you need to get notified. So that is the email that you will need to, to key in here. It's used for let's encrypt notification when certificate is expiring. That is, that is, it's, that is its main reason. Uh, so just put a dummy, dummy email like tito at Um, yeah, but in production environment, it needs to be a working email. Otherwise, you would need to get those notifications in case your your server certificate is expiring. So these are the variables down here, um, and the, the, you, you you don't have to change them if you want to say have Munin monitoring your your infrastructure, and you want to access also you you want to access to at least monitor your application with um, uh, with low root, then you need to have these left the way it is. And then <clears throat> Ansible connection. This is another very important uh, variable that you, you would change if, if your, your host up here are physical servers that you will be connecting to them via SSH, then you will need to change uh, connection to uh, to SSH from LXD. Supported options are LXD and SSH. Uh, and as I mentioned, LXD is if you want to set up an uh, BHS2 environment within single server using LXD connection. However, LX, um, SSH is supported also. So options for um, uh, proxy are Nginx and Apache 2. So Nginx, if you want to use uh, in, uh, Nginx reverse proxy and Apache 2, if your reverse proxy is going to be Apache 2. Right now, we have implemented Nginx. I'm going to write scripts for Apache 2 very soon. I've also started doing that. And also SSL type supported options are let's encrypt. It's the default. There's also custom SSL. Uh, uh, for custom SSL, you really need to have uh, your PEM files and key within um, a directory for uh, you know, you've procured your SSL certificate somewhere and you want to just use it, you don't want to use less encrypt, then you're going to use custom SSL. And then there is upstream. Upstream is when you, you do not uh, want SSL termination done here, you're doing it, maybe you're doing it somewhere else. You just want to set up DHS2 and you don't want to do anything uh, SSL at this point. And then there's also self-signed. Um... No, so that's a small suggestion while I'm looking at this. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if the time zone, whether you should 
push that up higher in the file because most of the stuff down there you just, will just leave the defaults but time zones one of the ones that you probably almost always going to change okay so, so we, maybe stick it stick it up with fqdn in the email okay it's just but otherwise people might miss it in the file yeah 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 just a small suggestion <laughs> It's also one of the one one of the variables that changes most of the time because people yeah. sitting at DHS two will be sitting at different uh, time zones. And yeah, so it's, so it's a good idea to give every, everything that's got sensible defaults, leave them at the bottom, and everything that's almost always going to change, put it near the top. Okay. Uh huh. Something else that we have on the list of the variables is time zone, as uh, Bob has mentioned. You want to set it to um to to your time zone and um and the command that you can use to list the supported time zones is, is this one here at least and also there is an lxd network so we've noticed in the past that sometimes your host network uh, uh would overlap with this network so uh, that means that uh, your setup is is going to have errors because um, the network that you want your LXD containers is overlapping with the network that you you are sitting on on your on your host. So that that is when you would uh, almost need to change. Uh, you would definitely need to change this to something else, at least uh, some other private IP address range uh, network. However, most of the time uh, we chose this. Uh, sorry, we chose this kind of address block. Uh, uh, and 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 we hope it's going to not overlap at most of the times with the with the network that users will be having. And then this is the, just an LXD bridge interface, <clears throat> um, and it, it's defaulting. Uh, we are using LXD bridge zero right now, but uh, you can change that also. Say you have an already an already, an already existing LXD network. Say LXD bridge zero, and you want to set up a fresh network for your DHS2 environment, then you change this to something else so that it will not overlap with the already existing network. If you want to have completely separate, separate um, network for your DHS2 deployment. And then there is guest OS. This is the, um, the OS that your containers will be running. Right now it's uh, Ubuntu 20.04 but you can also do Ubuntu um, 2204. We don't support 18 at this point. And also um, there's an architecture of your, your guest, operate, uh, guest OS MD4. This is the Intel version. And then there's also ARM-based systems. So you want to change this to, to that uh, architecture. So if we quickly list um, images, Alexi list, uh, or rather LXC image list Ubuntu, then you notice that the, 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 um, the images support different uh, architectures. Uh, yeah, there's times 8664 architecture, there's this uh, ARM71, and then, so it depends on your system really, the host that you are running. Yeah, and most of the hosts are running uh, this kind of architecture times 8664. This is um, this is really the default, the, the one that we are supporting by default, and it is um, AMD. <clears throat> yeah, so you might also want your instances, or rather you might have two different instances writing to different databases. So, yeah, if you have two databases hosts, for instance, you have Postgres and something else, then uh, the default is Postgres, but you can also change it to something else if you have two databases up here. If you have, for instance, uh, Postgres uh, one on, on a different IP address, say 30, so you're going to have another instance of DHIS2, say uh, HMIS2 and you want it to write to a different database, say Postgres one. Yeah, like this. So that's also possible so that you can, you can um, 
have different DHS2 instances writing to different databases. Yeah. So that comes in when people would want to separate production databases and, and, and training uh, instances of the, of the databases. Yeah. And then at the very uh, line 46 is the DHS2 WAR file. Um, because at the end of the day, you want to deploy a WAR file either from a file, if you have your WAR file within um, a directory, then you can just give uh, the path to that uh, directory. Or if you want to download it online when and you're doing the de deployment, then you just need to give the, the URL to that uh, WAR file link. And then, yeah. Of course, the Java version that you want to run. Right now, we are defaulting to Java 11, and we want to create databases during the deployment. And we want also to, at least if, 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 if you don't define this databases host up there, it defaults to Postgres. But that means you need to have a host defined there for the, for the database. So after that, <clears throat> uh, if you are on, um, on, on, if you're doing inst your installation on a single server, then um, we're going to use LXD connection. And um, at the end of the day, either way, if you are on, on a multiple server environment or single server environment, then you need to set up Ansible. So to set up Ansible is, is just, you need to, on a fresh server environment, you just need to update your server and then you need to supply your pseudo password. So this is going to just do install, uh, I mean, up, up, at least update your packages and then you need to upgrade on a very fresh environment. If, if uh, you don't have, you, you might be, you will be having are packages that needs uh, to be upgraded. So these errors that warning errors that we are getting here is because on Ubuntu 20.04, they are they are deprecated the support for um, custom PPS like these ones, Keystor Legacy, Trusted PG are deprecated. That's why you are getting these errors. Uh, warning, sorry, warning. And <clears throat> after that, you need to add software properties co common, super sudo. I mean, just following this um, uh, deployment guideline is that you need to add um, software properties uh, common. This is a package that helps you add uh, custom repositories. Uh, yeah, so you would install, of course, in, in my environment, it's already set up. So they are also already installed. That's why we, we get that this is already existing. Next is setting up Ansible, and we are adding um, official PPA uh, because we want to install latest version of Ansible, at least 2.11, 2.11, and, and above. That's why we are using uh, this official uh, repo PPA. Otherwise, if you just do install Ansible without adding that um, PPA, then you'll get, you might get uh, a version that you don't want. And after that, after adding the, the repo, then you need to install Ansible. And on this environment, it is installed. And if you check Ansible version, you notice that the version that we have is 2.13. So it's over, it's, it's, it's 2.11 above. So it, we are okay. We can now proceed with our installation. After you've set up um, Ansible in your system, remember if you are on, on a multiple server environment, then you're going to do this on, on a deployment server, on a deployment instance. However, on, on a single server environment, then you're going to do this within that single same server. So after you've set up, set up Ansible, then you need to get these um, community general modules. Yeah, so sudo so 
Ansible Galaxy Collection install community, community general module. So this will just pull latest um, community general modules. Minus F mean it's forcing. If this uh, more modules existing, it will delete and and get the new the new version. So this is also using internet connections at the at the end of the day. You need to have good um, internet in your in your server. Uh, yeah. So and then after that, we now proceed to deploying DHS2. So we need to go to the deploy folder, and then from there we run Ansible scripts. This is taking a while. Well, that is taking a while. Let's just read through this document. So we have also already edited the inventory host file and the very important things that you need to change there are actually the domain, fully qualified domain name, email address, and uh, Ansible connection and, um, and, and time zone as, as Bob mentioned. After that, you, you, you're you good to go. Um, yeah, so when this finishes here, uh, we have now community general 6.10 modules if they are installed successfully then we need to now proceed with the installation and on um, on lxd environment where you set up ansible on a single server environment uh, you need uh, to set up lxd environment with lxd proceed let's just go to the install the installation uh, we have our connection, it's the default on LXD. So we just need to run our playbook. And um, let's go to the installation bit. Ansible connection. After we are in the in the in the in the in the install directory. Yeah, so we need to navigate to the install directory. And then from there, we run the LXT setup uh, playbook. So this playbook has a few component. Let's just quickly check up. It has, um, it has firewall. Uh, this one sets up uh, rules on the host, ensuring that anything that hits port 80 is Forwarded to port 80 on the on the on the proxy container, or anything that hits 443 is proxy forwarded to your proxy container 443. And then LXD in its module uh, role, sorry, is going to set up your LXD automatically. You don't have to do that interactively. So it has two roles. One is firewall, and that and the next one is LXD in it. So if we run this sudo LXD sudo ansible uh, playbook. And LXD setup.yaml, then it's gonna run the task within those ro two roles. And you're noticing that it's not changing anything because I had run this before. And things that we need to note is that it's um, first of all um, checking if your firewall is running. If it is not, this all script is going to fail. I just let, let me just disable firewall effort and demonstrate that sudo apt sudo ufw disable and then run this script again you know it's failing because firewall is disabled you need to at least uh, have firewall running and and your ssh connection enabled so uh, i would enable firewall once more So that means firewall is enabled, and our um, LXT setup uh, will is no is, is now going to succeed. Another thing is that after it checks the firewall status, it checks uh, it sets the default forward policy because you want your forwarding be enabled. And then uh, because uh, traffic that are, are going to hit port eighty on your host are going to be forwarded to the proxy container, so you want forwarding enabled in your in your firewall. 
And then uh, you want also traffic to the LXD bridge not, not blocked by the firewall. That is, that is the work of this uh, task. And then you want to configure NAT um, from the host to the proxy container. Uh, next is install LXD because uh, your containers are going to run on LXD engine. So this task is going to install LXD. This is gonna get um, the setup info after in, it, it installed uh, LXD. And then this line initiates um, LXD with preceded configuration. And then, um, and then it will restart uh, LXD engine to, to make sure that those configuration that you had on your PC are taking effect. And finally, your, your environment will be set up. Yeah. So right now, everything is green because I have done the setup before, but on a fresh environment, this, there, there'll be changes here. There'll be changes, a lot of changes here. Uh, next is we do run uh, DHIS2 setup now. And uh, it's running uh, roles, roles, and the first one is Postgres because we want to set up our database first before we do set up uh, other other things like uh, DHIS2 web app web application, even MuNin and Nginx. So we are starting with the Postgres, and this ta the task inside um, this playbook is creating Postgres container. And then it will also include other tasks that are related to installing Postgres within the container, um, Postgres 13 in our case. And we are add, adding custom apt repository from official um, uh, Postgres because for, with that, we're going to get the fashion that we really want. Otherwise with Ubuntu uh, systems, if you have Ubuntu 18.04, then you will get Postgres 10. If you are on Ubuntu 20.04, you get Postgres 12. And you are when you are on Ubuntu 22.04, which is latest, you get Postgres that, uh, 14. So if you want Postgres 13, which is the currently supported version of DHS2, then you need to add um, official apt repository from Postgres and with that you can you can install any version that you want, including even the very old versions like Postgres 9. Yeah, that is why we do, because we did with, with this, now we can get the, the Postgres 13 version. Uh, after that, <clears throat> it ensures that Postgres is running the service. And then this, this is a warning because checks Postgres version module is switching user behind the scenes it's switching to postgres user and then it checks a uh, version without the need for uh, for password it's uh, what ansible scripts uh, is doing here is switching to postgres user uh, within the container and then it checks postgres version and that is why it's creating this temp directory this is the working directory of ansible on the on the remote host and this is the warning that Maybe it's uh, permission is 0700, meaning it is very strict. It's allowing only access by that user, Postgres user. And you might want to say, have other users be able to write to that file. That's why you're getting this one, but it's not. And that <clears throat> the created Postgres, um, uh, Postgres container um, is locked to being uh, only accessible on, on local, local host. So what's happening here, it's editing that file, ensuring that it's open to access from the DHS2 instance. It reads the instances from the direct, uh, from, the, um, from the inventory file, and it knows that we have one instance and we need to allow its IP at least to be, to be able to access Postgres from the, from the network. And then he, he, he wants your, your Postgres instance to be able to listen on LXD network also. Otherwise it will be, it will, it will not be accessible from the network. Then it, this is another line that um, ensures that Postgres is running a firewall. Let me just log into the, to the server and we can check that as we are talking about it. It has two, it has two, 
Canada. It ensures that Postgres has firewall running and it's allow it's allowing access from HMIS only. And then it's uh, it's starting um, Postgres uh, service. That is to make sure that uh, the configuration changes here because they need others need a restart of uh, of Postgres. It ensures that those configuration changes take effect. Next is creating now LXD containers for the instances. We are logged in. Just list quickly the instances that we have. Uh, where is it's this LXC list. You notice that now we have HMIS running, we have uh, Postgres running, it's creating this, it's on progress. And if I get into LXC Postgres container, you notice that we have firewall running and it's only allowing access from the, from the, from HMIS instance. If we had two instances, we would see two lines here. Yeah, so that is what I was talking about here. And then <clears throat> this script also will, is going to create, um, this is the next module now. The next module is um, DHIS2. This is related to creating DHIS2 containers and, and, and running tasks that are specifically for DHIS2, like installing Tomcat, installing Java, and now deploying the WAV file into those containers, running firewall, We're going to go through those tasks one by one. This is just creating LXD container. And then this is now running tasks in, inside that LXD container. First, it checks if uh, dhis2.com file exists. If it is not existing, then it means it's a fresh install. And that is why it needs to generate, generate that random uh, Postgres password and creates uh, instant database role. So you notice that this is delegated to Postgres container. So it's connecting to Postgres container and creating um, DHIS2 database role, creating DHIS2 database, and then and creating uh, even the um, extensions, uh, database extension, both GIS and, and Gene and TRGM, yeah. After that, now it's installing Java and Tomcat and zip. We need zip for, for us to be able to extract WAV file into the web apps directory. We need also to clean web, web apps directory, uh, ensuring that we don't have defaults. You know, when, when you install Tomcat, it come with the, with the defaults like root, um, default site. So we cleaning it to ensure that it's, it's having nothing completely. And then we will create, uh, we are creating here those directories again. And then um, we're creating opt DHIS2 directory and uh, even adding DHIS2.com file, you know, with the password and stuff and, and even the database we are connecting to. Uh, so if you're noticing uh, the database that uh, DHIS2.com that we're going to have will reflect all those uh, configurations that we want because this is a Jinja2 file, it takes variables from uh, whatever they were defined. And then also server.xml. They are all custom uh, to ensure that they meet the best security practice that we want. Even the LXD uh, Tomcat 9 um, systemd service, there are, there are some things that we are overwriting to ensure that we are adhering to the best security. And then, <clears throat> yeah, so these are mostly security uh, uh, practices, uh, hardening, so to speak, and um, oh, sorry, just a just a quick time check. You you're down to your last eight minutes now. I think if yeah. you want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. Okay. So and this is an archive thing now. At the end of the day, it will finish installation. Uh, go to the next role, which is now proxy setting up proxy, and the roles that are related like sideboard in the next site and finally it's working on monitoring because we want to monitor our our environment with munin you know so and um yeah so there are things that are that they are repeatable like firewall we want to have firewall running in all our containers we also want to ensure that we have configuration so those those things are repeatable and and um and and so there are some other tasks that are specifically related to 
some containers like uh, like things to do with proxy nginx are going to be only running on nginx proxy on on proxy and yeah so yes yeah, so if we get to the server and we check the containers that we have right now we're going to have by uh, hmis this is the dsis2 instance monitor is the monitoring instance and postgres is the database and proxy is is now um, the entry point and right now it's finishing it's finishing this is this is even a table so it's finished it's set up those four containers and the way it's set up you, you it means that you when you go to the um, cut inventory host when you go to your domain then you should have service running there right now Uh, Tico, good morning. Morning. Yeah. Uh, just one quick question. Mm. Will it not be possible, like, uh, just with one command, when you um, create, when you enter the command, mm. it installs most of all these things for you directly. Then later you can do your own configuration. Yes, that is what I'm working on. If you check this uh, deploy.sh, deploy.sh file, it's going to do that uh, behind the scenes. Like it's going to set up this um, uh, Ansible environment and then install the community general module and then it runs the, um, the, the playbooks. And you don't have to do that manually. So this is what I'm working on. I'm actually right now testing, ensuring that it support. This first part is, is okay. I'm working on testing this second part, which is going to be using SSH connection if you your environment is is on a multiple server environment. So this is okay. what I'm right now, yeah. Yeah, so, and also I'm confused with one thing, like mm -hmm. this port 22 and port um, 822, what is different between the two? Is it that when you are at port 822, hackers cannot hack you or they can still hack you? What is different? SSH, you mean SSH port? Yeah, like 822 and also 22. Okay, so <clears throat> normally, uh, we want to avoid defaults when 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 we are exposing ports to the to the to the internet, and SSH default port is twenty two. So when when somebody wants to hack you, then uh, they they have enough information already if you are using default port like twenty two, and then they'll now start trying their computation and and yeah you know they they already have the port. However, if you do diff a different port, say eight thousand twenty two, then they need to first figure out where the port is before they start, um, you know, lead us to your, your default. So it's just- uh, yeah. yeah, you know, there's, there's a very big caveat there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a good idea to move to port. Yeah, it just reduces the number of kind of drive-by attacks. But yeah. you've got to be really careful not to change the port to something above 1,024. Because the ports below a thousand and twenty-four are privileged ports. If you listen to your 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 SSH on port eight thousand, then it does mean that an unprivileged user could be could masquerade as your SSH service, and in theory could could I don't know um, collect credentials or what have you. So yeah, by all means, ch change the port. Um, but never change it above 1,024. Okay, okay yeah. all right. Thank you. But it's not necessary. I mean, the, the, the degree of... You're not really getting any extra protection by moving the port. Um, you're just going to... You're going to get less noise in your log file. You're less likely to be hit by a casual bot. But anyone who really wants to find you will find you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I have, uh, Tito, sorry. Uh -huh. Tito, sorry, Tito. Yes? Um, so, so my question actually rely on um after you put the domain, I don't want to actually put slash HMIS. Um, yes. that that you have not demonstrated that. Yeah, right now, um, that is a feature that we want to add in future, uh, and um. If you have two applications, HMIS and say training, then that means first of all, before you think about that, you need to have two subdomains, right? You need to have two domains that are going to both listen on root. 
otherwise if you have two applications say hmis and something else and you want to that, that that then if you redirect everything for HM, hmis access then the other applications that you have will not be accessible within this with the same um, subdomain so if you have two applications running you need to have two subdomains for that to be supported however if, if it's just one then you can you can just edit um in the next file or a packet two file and we want also to automate that with ansible so if we list um the containers we have there's proxy so you want to lxc exec um proxy bash sorry and go to the nginx configuration it's a uh, nginx i think it's in um conf d yeah so this is the um, the site configuration and you want to add, add a, a, a redirect somewhere here let me just do that right now rewrite everything that goes to to be hmis sudo the next uh, just reload So that means if you hit uh, HMIS dot, uh, sorry, my domain name, let's just see, if you hit uh, here, it should redirect you to HMIS, let's see. Yeah. So that's just a line that you need to add and you add, to, okay. Yeah. yeah. However, yeah. that means if I, I had another application here, it will just be redirecting everything to HMI. So you need to have two subdomains for different, if you want to support two different applications. No, understand, understand, understand. Yeah. Yes, so uh, any other question? It's 13 hours. Yeah, it's the top of the of the hour. So if we do not have other questions, then we may, maybe you can call it a day. I think I'm for me, I'm fine. I, I don't know if there are others. Uh, probably look at the chat. Um, probably the questions there. Okay. Yeah, 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 see. I'll, I'll I'll take the 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 the, the, the comments on the on the on the chat and also thank you for the feedback. Bob, I think Bob had to leave. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I think we are good. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, Tito. Thanks very much. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. I, okay, I like okay. On the on the on the on the telegram, yeah, yeah. Bye.